here's a summary of what we're going to do today and you'll get access to this of course so the first one is going to be the theory behind the cage system and I'm actually going to preface this with an introduction about what I call the seven fields of guitar mastery uh, it's kind of how I like to break down the mastery of guitar in general and what you can be practicing at any given point in time think of it as if I was to make a metaphor with the gym you know it's very overwhelming when you first go to the gym you're just like what do I do you know you have a goal roughly everyone wants to go to the gym to get healthier whatever you, that means to you right whether it's getting more muscle or just leaner or or just upping your cardio right whatever it is but then there's so many things that you can be working on when it comes to your health and so breaking down what are the different um, fields you know the different parameters that you can be working on to improve your health gives you a better understanding of what you should be practicing how often and to clarify your goal setting so we're going to talk about this for a little bit then um, we'll talk about what the cage system is and what it is not okay so that you can you can you won't get confused questions I get sometimes is can you use cage to play major scales right questions like this won't happen once you understand what the cage system is and what it is not right which we'll see the cage system is a map it's not like any sort of musical reality it's a map and it's a guitar specific map that only exists because of how the guitar is tuned and because of how overwhelming the fretboard is in terms of the layout of all the notes right we don't have a linear layout like pianists and therefore we need a map all musicians have maps to how to play their instrument not necessarily visual maps sometimes you know for uh, different instruments it's a little bit different we all use maps but on the guitar we definitely need one because I don't know if you've noticed but this can be a confusing territory here right it's easy to get lost so we're gonna talk about this we're gonna talk about how it's built we're gonna talk about intervals and the cage system and we're gonna talk about um, how you can find smaller triads we call trim down triads in the cage system minor and major pentonics in the cage system and then finally we'll look into some applications about um, how you can actually practice the cage system if you want to get better at it and then of course some um, real life applications I'll basically put myself in a context and show you how I can use the cage system to navigate this context and play you know navigate my fretboard using that map all right so there we go okay let's see if we have new we'll watch online later thanks for doing this no worries Josh as long as you show up here I um, that's awesome already um, I really appreciate it so I will repost this and it'll be here it'll be on Facebook on my website so uh, and on YouTube normally so abs no problem okay all right let's get into it really quickly if people join that's great if not that means too bad um, let me see if I can get a few late people here I got some a notification okay there we go awesome hey also feel free to share the event if you think that um, that some people would be interested in it you know um, you can totally uh, share this event over here invite some friends that are guitarists and um, yeah I'm going to there we go okay awesome so let's get into it let's just wait no longer over here so the seven fields of guitar mastery step number one so when you decompose music in general when you think about what it is to become good at the guitar again it's good to have a clear framework to making progress so that you know what you can practice at any given point in time and now again this might sound like an exaggeration or like it's not super super accurate 
but it's a framework, right? So I noticed personally as a teacher and as a you know, college professor and a guitarist myself that when you're trying to get better at music and when you actually do achieve mastery on the guitar, it's due to a combination of those seven different kind of skills. So we'll go through all of them a little bit. But the first one is stylistic. Uh, well, actually, let's start with the first one, uh, the other one. We'll start with um, music theory. So music theory is the rational understanding of music. It's being able to define, so I can explain this because so many people, so many things about music theory. I mean, it's such a, an argued topic that even in a group called guitar and music theory, people argue about music theory. So that's to say how controversial that topic is, right? Um, so music theory is again, the rational, oh, you're losing volume. Let me see if I can, let me know if this is better. I just probably was a little too far away from my microphone here. Um, let me know if this works better. So, so again, music theory answers questions such as the following. What is a major scale? What is a minor scale? What is a major chord, a minor chord, right? So it has a descriptive value because it describes all the things that we use in music theory, or sorry, in music in general to make music. Now, music theory also has a functional aspect to it. All right, because in the functional aspect refers to the fact that you can also predict things with music theory. For example, you can look at a chord progression and say, well, because of this certain series of chords, I know that I should probably be favoring this scale if I want to sound a certain way, consonant. If I want to sound out, I can ignore that rule, right? But it's giving me a framework, a list, an array of options and that and you'll see that amongst these options there is usually very simple ways of improvising over anything using some pentatonics and then some more complicated ways such as you know arpeggios over each chord some modes or fuller scales diminished scales all sorts of fancy things right but again you have these two arrays of options and um, music theory answers these questions it really does right it's nothing esoteric or hard to understand or whatever it's again it's very useful if you understand the whole thing coherently all right and it's applicable i will say that actually music theory is quite obviously applicable if you understand it well it's immediately it's really obvious why and how you should be able to apply it if to you music theory is not easy to apply, that means you don't understand it. The understanding of theory is predicts the fact that you know how to apply it or not, okay? So just putting this out there. Second thing is ear training. So ear training is the ability to recognize those tools by ear. So for example, you know, it's one thing to know what red is, the color red on like a in a physical way, you can learn like the, the frequency, the definition of, but then recognizing that color by ear, being able to see it and just immediately have that name pop out in your mind, that's a different thing. And in music, we're using these tools all the time. So what is a major scale? Okay, I know what a major scale is. Can I recognize the sound of it? Because if you can't recognize the sound of it, you're gonna have a hard time really knowing how to really use it. So again, with theory, you can put yourself in a situation where you never really play wrong notes per se, because theory answers that questions of note accuracy. But it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be intentional about the notes that you're going to play. And that usually that difference in intentionality, being able to know exactly what note you want to hear at that moment, what scale you want to hear, that is a difference that comes from knowing how to actually recognize these tools and it's a work that involves ear training okay so then we have communication so that's very simple that's being able to talk the language of music to read it to write it to talk to other band members so you know it could be some jam or band vocabulary all the tools that there's a specific lingo to music just like everything uh, you know you hear sometimes musicians nerd out 
and so, or I know what my friends sometimes will be nerding out talking about progressions and things like that and and then there's other people that aren't musicians and they're like what are you guys talking about right we're using English everything makes sense in some way but there is a specific lingo that applies to musician so it's the communication aspect of music but it's also reading chord progressions writing chord charts reading actual staff if you're interested in that right all those things are important or can be important right rhythm rhythm is the ability to know how to play tight specific time divisions and then even uh, better to groove with these time divisions okay um, when it comes um, the next part is technique so technique is going to sorry I'm going a little quicker on these because I want to get into the subject technique is the ability to physically execute something so I know what a major scale is I can hear a major scale I can define communicate a major scale I know my rhythm but at some point I gotta play the scale I need my fingers to do the right things on the fretboard and that's technique all right and then finally we have fretboard navigation fretboard navigation again is a topic that's unique to guitar because we need a navigation system for this crazy crazy world which is the fretboard okay so here is the um, the thing you can really only understand those fields if you understand music theory music theory is kind of above all these things so not above but it precedes all these things because how are you going to communicate what a scale is if you don't know what it is how are you going to hear a major chord if you don't know what it is or how to name it how are you going to properly write down rhythms or interiorize rhythms if you have no conceptual knowledge of how beats divide and what a time signature is how are you going to actually frame your progress set goals and things like that's so like my goal is to learn my major scale okay what's a major scale that's music theory boom now you gotta learn music theory okay my goal is to learn my arpeggios arpeggios of what well arpeggios of all my chords what is a chord music theory again all right so again for I know most of you here probably don't need to be convinced about the utility of music theory but we never know so Today's topic is going to be specifically or mostly focused on fretboard navigation and music theory, but specifically fretboard navigation. Okay, so we're going to talk about, about that. Let's get into it right now. So before I get into it, by the way, for everyone here that are here, thank you so much. If you wait till the end, I will send you a link that will... Um, send you to a little email form you sign up with your email and this way I can send you all the documents that I'm going to use in this video okay so again click the link that I'm gonna I'm gonna give to you at the end of the video this will motivate you hopefully to stay through the whole thing even though it's a little it's a long master class but again you'll get put in your email and I just no questions asked it just sends you straight it's automated it just sends you all the documents that are in this um, that I'm gonna use in this master class all right cool so let's get started you have any questions if you have questions let me know uh, Danny love to soak up the knowledge when I can you're the best for doing stuff like this thank you so much I appreciate it um, it's uh, it's my pleasure I love teaching and I love helping people with this stuff all right realize that I had a some sort of a I'm, I'm okay. I guess I'm decent at it. I guess at least that's the feedback that I've gotten. So um, it's normal. It's natural that I would share and try to share this. It's really a passion of mine. Thank you. So, okay. So let's talk about the cage system, what it is and what it is not. So let's preface this. The cage system is not a theoretical truth. It's not like a scale right it's not something like this like a pentonic scale can be played by any instrument it is something that we've defined in music theory we know what it is it is not that okay the cage system this only applies to the guitar and as we'll see it applies to the guitar because of the way the guitar is tuned okay the cage system is not a technique it's not like um, a technique in the way that it's something physical that you practice like a scale again all right of course you can practice the cage system 
bit, it brings me to the third point, which is that the K system is a map. And it's a map that allows us to navigate the complex territory of the fretboard. So think about what a map is. A map is never the territory, right? If you go to, you know, you go walking or you take your car, and you're going on a road trip and you have a map. Is the map the territory that you're going to be driving through? Say you're in Colorado, like me. A map of Colorado. What is the goal of this map? Well, the goal of this map is to be able to navigate the, ter the territory of Colorado. Sorry. All right. It is not the territory. So what is the actual Colorado territory made of? It's made of mountains. It's made of, you know, rivers and landscapes and houses and all sorts of complicated things. And look at the fretboard. If you see over here, the fretboard, look at this. Does this look simple to you? Though this is how notes are laid out on the guitar fretboard. You can see why it's going to be kind of difficult to use notes as your way to find things on the fretboard. Again, on the keyboard, it's immediate. You <laughs> gross, yeah, right. You have one octave that's straight that repeats, and the sharps and flats are indicated with black keys. Like everything about a keyboard is made to use notes as your navigation. So what's the easiest way to play a scale on the keyboard? Well, it's easier to use your knowledge of the notes to know, for example, that the C major scale is C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. You know where those notes are on the fretboard, you play them, and you can see them as you play them. The mapping between the notes and the tool that you're using is very simple. That's why pianists you know, when they usually know theory better, because to them, knowing the definition of a scale, such as the definition of the B flat major scale, is the easiest way to actually perform that scale on the piano, because they can learn their, their notes in two seconds, and every octave repeats exactly the same. Does that make sense? On the guitar, look at this fretboard over here. Is it Immediate, do you think that knowing the definition of the C major scale is going to be the easiest way to play that scale? Absolutely not. It's much easier to use a shape, to use another reference. So that's why we use shapes on the guitar. We use shapes because they're visually much more useful to actually play scales. And then again, it's not over because those shapes are not the same all over the fretboard. They change all the time, and that's what we'll see with the cage system. So there is another difficulty that comes in place, all right? Yet, these shapes, when you learn a shape for a specific chord, a specific scale, a specific mode, again, the problem is the reliance on that knowledge alone of just the geometry of a shape on the fretboard, and then forget about the theory, forget about the why that shape is the way it is, and then even sometimes worse for some guitarists, forget about even trying to learn any note on the fretboard. I'll just figure it out by ear. All right? I'll just muddle through until I, until I get to where I want to be. Those shapes are very powerful only if you understand what they are made of and why they are the way they are, for one, and for two, where to put them on the fretboard. Okay, I know that this shape here, is the shape of a major scale, provided that I started on my E string. How do I know where to play a C major using this knowledge? Well, I need to know where my reference note is. And that reference is the note C, if I want to play C, which is this fret. If I don't know my notes on the fretboard well, and specifically on the E string and the A string, which we'll talk about, those are the strings really if you're going to choose two strings to learn all your notes and to be really a pro at that, E string and A string, all right? At least, of course, you should know all the notes, but those two, they are absolutely essential if you want to, you know, do anything useful in, um, in music. So anyways, that's kind of the whole thing over here, right? The fretboard is complicated. So let's see, it's, it's like Colorado. Colorado is complicated. So what do you do when you choose a map? Why do you need a map? Well, first of all, you need a goal. What is that map for? People that are doing hiking or people that are driving or pilots, we're all gonna use different maps. 
No map is good or bad as long as it is accurate according to what it's supposed to do. Okay, again, as according to if you know the goal of your map, here's a map of the roads of Colorado. As long as my roads are accurate and they're well placed and the right numbers and everything, you can't say that map is great. It's awesome. And the cage system is the same way. The cage system is a map with a specific goal in mind. And in this way, it, you can't say that the cage system is bad. You'll see that on the forums. The cage system is bad. It's going to hurt your plane. What does that even mean? Does, does a map of the roads of Colorado going to hurt your driving? I mean, <laughs> that's not what it is. It's a map. Again, and as a map, like we'll see, it has limitations. But don't go around saying that the cage system is good or bad. It's a great framework to make this thing, see this, look more like this. Now, Notice a few things over here. For one, it seems a little more digestible, all right? For two, you see that where here I had just a bunch of notes, now I have numbers. R here, by the way, refers to root, and then the other things are the core tones, major third and perfect fifth, so intervals. And I'm actually, I recorded a hour and a half long video on YouTube video on intervals that I'm going to release really soon. So if you have trouble with intervals, you can go ahead and watch it. But for now, again, intervals refer to, you can see it as the relationship between a note versus another uh, as a reference. So here, my root, when I draw this cage system over here, becomes a reference. And this is what's interesting over here. And you need to understand that notes are inert unless you give them a value. And you give them a value by setting a reference. What does it mean to set a reference? For example, when I say I'm in the key of C or C major, what does this mean? That means C becomes kind of raises itself out of all these notes over here to become a special note. C becomes our reference, our home. And therefore, you could imagine all the C's on the fretboard being highlighted with a special importance. They become um, the reference. As soon as you establish a reference, all the other notes are going to have a special or specific relationship with that reference. And that relationship, the way we name these relationships in music, is intervals. Intervals are the way we name relationships. Okay? So... Now, let's say, so here obviously it seems like my reference is F, so all my Fs are going to have this special meaning, and therefore they're in red, okay? So those are my first landmarks for mapping my cage system. And then we'll see that the other most important landmarks just after the one. So first you need to know where one is, where that reference is. And when you know where one is, Right after that, the most important thing you can do is know where your main chord tones, which are the third major, if it's a major context or major chord or scale, and minor third, if it's a minor context or key or scale, and then the perfect fifth. Knowing where these elements are is kind of like setting your main landmarks on your map. And then again, the other notes are still there. All right, they, they haven't disappeared, but it's like these are important to us. They're kind of, we want them to see them, at, um, sorry, we want them to stick out, right? And when you look at your fretboard, if F is your reference, you should be able to map the fretboard and know where these references are, all right? So why one, three, and five? Why, right, why are these chord tones the most useful? Well, they're useful for many reasons. The first one is you're going to be playing a lot of major and minor chords in music. I don't know if you've noticed, right? Reply in the comment. Who here has played major and minor chords and spends most of their time either playing major and minor chords or variations of these major, major and minor triads? So like major seven, that's still a variation, right? Minor seven, uh, seven dominant, things like that. Like those triads are foundational in music and you need to know where they are. And because they're foundational, you're also going to be hanging out on these chord tones when you're soloing, when you're improvising, when you're writing melodies. Okay? These chord tones are always going to be special because 
from a pure just like physical or experiential way of like when you listen to music i will say i'm trying to explain it the best way here well the one the root resolves all tensions the fifth is the second most consonant interval and the third guides us towards either the majority or minority of our context and as humans we like to hear these three things we want to know where is my reference and then where is this a major or minor context we want to set some elements over here all right just so you know when when people listen to music even though they don't know these things they're subconsciously listening for those things we like reference we know what it sounds like to resolve a line on the one note or on the one chord these are things we're used to hearing here in our western world that's why if you've ever listened to atonal music which is defined by the fact that there is no center there's no one right it's just constantly moving around it sounds absolutely random it sounds to me it's not really it's a tool you can use a tonal sections in your tunes when you really want to create some suspense or tension or in a movie scene but I trust me if you're on a road trip and you start putting some atonal music see how long it takes for your you know the person that are driving with you see how long it takes for them to ask you what the hell we're listening <laughs> what is that music let's change it okay so again we like to hear those ones the red notes here we want to hear them so you need to know where they are on the fretboard. And then the three and the five, or the flat three and the five, are next in line in terms of importance. Whew. Does everything make sense? Is everyone um, following me for now? We lost a few people. Maybe I lost a few. I hope I'm making myself as clear as possible. So for those of you that are here, awesome. Thank you. Okay, construction of the cage system. Here it is. So that's a PDF. Oh, sorry, it's not that one. Um, boom, where is it? There we go. There it is. So we're gonna get that PDF. Uh, if you, afterwards, I'll put the link down there. Just put in your email, send these to you. So there's a quick reminder on what major triads are, etc. I want to pref um, do again a pref pref preface. Preface. I can't speak English anymore. Um, about where the cage system comes from and how it is built. Where does it originate? Okay. So again, other than it's very useful, it or it originates from how the guitar is tuned. Okay. So. The guitar is tuned in a very special way. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's again, seems like everyone's trying to make the guitar difficult to navigate and specifically difficult for guitarists to understand theory. Okay. So we'll see that the shapes, the five shapes of the cage system exist because of the way the guitar is tuned and the guitar was tuned not to make sense in theory. I think we all already know that. Okay just like the piano for example is made very linearly it makes sense in theory that's not the goal of the guitar the goal of the guitar is to play the main open chords okay the standard tuning e tuning system of the guitar is a, w a great way to efficiently play in the open position with full voicings involving all the strings, right? Involving all, or almost all the strings that you can strum at once, these chords, the C major chord, the A major chord and minor chord, the G major chord, the E major and the E minor chord, and the D major and D minor chord. So I guarantee that most of you here have learned when they first held a guitar. They weren't showed, you, nobody's gonna say this is the note C and this is the C major scale. And if look, if you take the first and the third and the fifth note of this scale, you get a C major, um, a C major chord. That is how pianists are taught. It's like sit in front of the piano, see all the white notes, that's the C major scale. Take the first one, the third, and the fifth, that's a C major chord. 
So you learn triads first and major scales first. What do you learn first when you play the guitar, when you learn the guitar? Usually it's E minor or E major. Why is that? Well, because it's simple to play. And why is it simple to play? It's simple to play because the guitar was tuned so that that chord can be simple to play. I can play all the strings and it's really easy. If I want to play a minor chord, take off this finger. And again, it's really hard and people are like, well, why, why does taking off my finger make a minor chord? And then, why does taking off my finger make a minor chord? That if someone asks you this on the first lesson, you're like, hold on a second, right? <laughs> uh, I can't tell you right now, okay? Just trust me. If you would take a finger off, that's a minor chord. And why is it hard? On the piano, it's very easy. I play a major chord, and then it's like, look at the third. See the third finger here on the, again, if I, I'll, I'll put a keyboard over here, maybe so you can see that piano keyboard. Okay, there we go. I don't know what this website is, but okay. So for those of you that don't know how to, uh, maybe don't know how to navigate a keyboard, it's very simple. That first note is C, and then all the white notes are the notes without sharps and flats. All the black notes are the notes that are between these notes, which have sharps and flats. So you can see everything. You can see how there's no sharp between E and F, no sharp between B and C, and then everything is laid out and octaves just repeat. Super, super simple. A C major chord would be the first, the third, and the fifth note of this scale that has all the white notes. And if you want to make that chord minor, it's very simple. You take the third and you go down one half step to the note that's right before. Whatever that note is on any major chord, that's what you do if you want to get a minor chord. All right? Now, as we'll see, that's not as easy when it comes to guitar. Why is it not as easy? Where is the third in my chord here? All right, what is a third? Well, a third is the third note of a major scale. Okay, but I don't know how to play a major scale. What is a major scale? And all these questions start popping up. And now you understand why guitarists are like, I don't know about the theory thing. I think I'd rather just play my chords. All right, because this sounds complicated. It doesn't seem to apply to this instrument. I just rather just learn my shapes give up now in theory, forget about it, all right? That's a lot of guitarists, right? Tell me if that's ever, ever happened to you on your guitar journey. Happens to every guitarist normally, all right? So why again? Well, because you have to explain so many things before, <laughs> even though it's actually easy. Yes, absolutely, Rob. So you gotta think about, your, you have to establish so many things before you start understanding what's actually happening under those fingers here. For one, you need to establish, well, what a chord is. And because E major is the first chord that you learn, sometimes C major, again, that could be a little easy, you can learn the scale. But again, it's not as easy to play scales like that. And it's not easy to visualize them. On the piano, even if you can't play the scale, at least you can see it. And though you can see what's going on when you're making a chord. On the guitar, when you've just started playing this, <laughs> it's hard to play, all right? So you need to have a knowledge of chords before you establish why the cage system is the way it is. And you need a knowledge of triads, which are, again, the chords of three notes, major and minor triads. Now, I'm gonna assume that you guys know this. So again, a major triad is a root, which I will call one, a major third, which I'll just put a three, that's the standard notation, and a fifth. And then a minor triad is one flat three, five. Okay, so far so good, or like, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. So, so that means, but I don't get it, because here, there are six notes on this chord. There isn't just three notes. So, you know, students will say, they're like, well, what are you talking about? Three notes, that's a triad? I'm playing six strings. What's going on? So you have to say, well, okay, hold on a second. 
It's actually a little more complicated than that because you don't really need just three notes to play a triad because if notes repeat, they don't count really. Like, so if I, for example, played one, five, one, three, five, one, well, if you reorganize these notes and you really look at, you get rid of the repetitions, that's actually just one, three, five in order. Therefore, this is actually still a triad. Way to confuse students. They're like, okay. So they're like, trust me, that's just how it is. Now that again, what is the difference between one, five, one, three, five, one, and one, three, five? It's a different of voicing. The voicing is the actual order of notes and the actual way that you play a chord on the instrument from its theoretical definition, which is always just pretty simple, like one, three, five. But then you can voice that one, three, five in many, many ways. And as long as the bottom note is the root, you can put as many combinations as of one, three, fives, and in any order that you want on top of this, it will still be a triad, or in this case, if it's one, three, five, a major triad. Now you need the root on the bottom. If you don't, as we'll see, it's called an inversion of that chord. So it's a little different, all right? But again, as long as I have a low E over here, because it's an E major, and then on top combinations of the notes of an E major chord, which is E, G sharp, and B, I get an E major. Now again, E, G sharp, and B. So why these notes? Well, now you have to explain the notion of major scale because again, these the one, the major third, and the perfect fifth are from the major scale. So you need to learn to build this major scale before you start understanding why the heck there is a G sharp, for example, in E major, and why there isn't in, in C major. All right, like well, that the major scale is a sequence: whole step, whole step, half step, whole, 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 half. And so you'll get different sharps and flats depending on where you start. If I start on E and I go E whole step F sharp again, because it's a half step after E and then G sharp. So here's my third note. Then a half step goes to A and then a whole step goes to B. Now I see my one, my three and my five. All right. Now I get it. Sweet. Okay. So what is this E major? What is the voicing of that E major? Well, let's erase this. The voicing of that E major is the following. It's over here. It's root, fifth, a root again, an octave above, the third, the fifth, and the root. Not an obvious voicing. It's a little different than one, three, five, right? Run three, five would be easy. Can you imagine on the piano if the first chord you learned was this? That would mean playing E here, then the fifth above, which is G, then the main, then E again, right here, then G sharp all the way over here, and then B. So it's a it's a five finger chord that you would have to play on the piano. Guarantee if piano were, if pianists were told to play chords like this, they would be confused about theory too. But again, on the piano, it doesn't make sense. But on the guitar, that's why the guitar was built is to play these main open chords um, over here. So one, five, one, three, five, one. So the things to notice on this um, voicing over here is for one, that the reference is on the low E string. So wherever you put that reference on the low E string, you're going to have, you're going to preserve the order of these notes. So you can move this shape and make it what we call a movable E shape over up and down the fretboard. But when you move it, well, you have to compensate for the lack of open strings, hence the use of bar chords. When I play a G major like this, why is, G, is this a G major? It's a G major because it's the same exact organization of notes as this over here, E major, except I'm moving everything up to where my reference is on the note G over here on the E string. 
but my voicing is the same. One, five, one, three, five, one. And my reference is on the low E string. Therefore, we call this the a G major, which it is, played in an E shape. Because again, it's the shape of an open E that I made movable using a bar chord. So an E shape, you can play an E shape wherever you want. All you need is to find the reference that you want on your low E string. You put your index on that reference. For example, this is B. And then you play the shape. Now that's where, again, newbie guitarist start, stops. And in this group here, we're going to go a step further. You need to know the voicing of this chord. You need to know that that, when you, when you look at each finger, that's the root, that's the fifth, that's the, I'm going to stop sharing so you can, well, actually I'll show here. That's the root, that's the fifth, that's the root again, an octave above. That's the third, there's only one third, that's the fifth, and that's the root again. All right? Okay. So let's look at another shape and let's, and you'll see why I jumped straight to this shape. But now let's look at our um, G shape. What I want you to notice before I jump into the G shape, because this is going to be important, is that I've become okay at making lines on my pad like this, is that wherever my, when I play an E shape, wherever I put my reference, all my notes are laid out on the right, on the right side of this axis over here, which is where I put my root. John Mayer talks about this a lot, that axis, all right, of where you put your root. There is this notion of axis. And again, it's because we need navigation. We're literally navigating the, the, the fretboard. So we're going to have some similar language than when you're trying to navigate a city. Turn right. And then this landmark, one block after this landmark, you have this other thing. All right. We're going to use a lot of that with the fretboard. But so here, notice that the E shape, when you play an E shape, all your fingers are laid out to the right of this axis where you put your reference, your root. Okay. And again, all the other fingers are over here. Now, Let's look at another shape, which is the G shape. So if I look at a G shape, here's what I get. I notice that my root or my reference is also on the low E string. But if I draw an axis over here, I notice that my fingers are now laid out on the left of this root. Okay. Now, this is the open G. There's actually two ways to play open G. Sometimes you'll have the double finger over here on the B and E string. So you'll actually play the fifth over here. But if we want to make this shape movable, we can't do this. So we need to sacrifice to actually play the third over here. And again, these are still the right notes, right? So when I look at my voicing of this chord, I'm actually playing the right order. I'm going one, three, five, one, three. So I'm following the order of the notes and we'll see that we actually sometimes we usually scratch that note over here because again, it's really hard to play. If you want to play a movable G shape with the high note, it looks like this. Now, this is not cool sounding enough that I would go out of my way to play a shape like this. I'd rather play an E shape. They're so similar sounding. Remember, here's a little nugget. You only want to go out of your way to play a complicated shape if it sounds cool, all right? If it sounds so cool that you're like, this is worth my complicated shape over here because it's a really cool sounding chord like this, right? I like that chord. I think the voicing is great and there's no other way to play this chord. So I will go through the pain of having to learn this complicated shape. But that here, does it sound that cool compared to this especially? Not worth it, okay? However, here is a way to play the G shape that is really cool and useful. And that's when you don't actually play. So imagine that you're not playing this high um, one over here. So you just go root three, five, one, three. And so in the movable shape, it'll look like this. All right, that's your movable G shape. So here it is over here. 
and I like it because again you can hammer on with this finger it has a really nice soulful sound so that G shape is actually used a lot now again look at this axis over here on this axis all the notes are laid out on the left side of this axis so this is kind of interesting already and I love to see the cage system like this the cage system again is a navigation system so that to me is useful to know it's useful to know that if I put any reference on my low E string let's take one over here for example I will find an E shape that allows me to go right so to go higher on the fretboard if I want to voice it like this and the voicing goes one five one three five one okay and so that's my E shape and on the left side I have my G shape which goes one three five one three boom so now you look at your fretboard you want to play an A major you have two options you don't have to play A major well first of all open you can say, well, there's A over here on the low E string, and I can go left with a G shape, or I can go right with an E shape. It gives me two options. If, and if I add that first open shape, I already have three ways to play the same chord. All right, so again, remember, one of the uses of the cage system is that it is a way to have many options to play major chords, and as we'll see, then minor chords in any chord or tool that you want. Because again, the f we're, we're setting landmarks over here, of one, three, and five, but as we'll see, when you know these landmarks, it's, re it's really easy to then navigate other things, like pentatonic scales, full-on scales, different chords, right? When you know where one, three, and five is, or one flat three and five for the minor side of this, it's easy to find everything else on the fretboard. All right, side note. So we got the G shape and the E shape. All right. Now here's what's interesting. The only reason that we have more than just two shapes on the guitar is due to the fact, and only due to the fact, that the B string is not tuned the same way as the other strings. Rob says, I guess it helps learn and execute arpeggios too. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. You'll see like the, the similarities between the shapes and all the other things like a major G shape, a pentonic, an arpeggio, a major scale. They can all be seen and found really quickly with that landmark or navigation or map of each shape. Okay. So, yes, caged absolutely does. So what I was saying again, the only reason that we don't just have a G shape and an E shape is because of the B string. I bet you guys know this, but when you look at the distance from one string to the next, they're all tuned two and a half steps apart, which corresponds to a perfect fourth interval. So between the E and the A string, two and a half steps, perfect fourth. Between the A and the D string, two and a half steps, perfect fourth. Between the D and the G string, two and a half steps, perfect fourth. But between G and B, well, G, A, B, two full steps. That is a major third. We're lacking a half step here. And then again, between B and E, we're back to our two and a half steps. But between G and B, we lack one half step. So when I take my G shape and I move it up, or when I take my A shape, or my E shape, sorry, and I move it up, when I mean move it up, I mean I take the same configuration of notes, but I move my reference up to the A string. The only reason why we don't have a G shape anymore, but we have a C shape, is because of the B string. If there wasn't the B string, there would just be two shapes, one that goes right, and one that goes left. So again, let's let's build that together. So again, we're gonna take an E shape and we're gonna see what happens when I move it up 
to an A shape. And we're going to do it in the open position. But of course, this applies to the movable chord as well. So my reference in the A shape is here. So I have my one over here. Then five over here. Notice how for now, it's the same exact thing, right? If I was building my E shape, I would get one, five. Then my one over here, still the same thing. Okay, what about here? Well, here, I reach the B string. And the B string is tuned a half step lower. So where we normally would find our major third here, we have to go up a half step to compensate. So normally it'd be here, but we find it here. And then we go back to normal. So again, the A shape is what you get when you take an E shape and you move it up on the fretboard. So you move your reference from the E string to the A string. And so that repercussion is going, that thing is going to have repercussions over everything else on the guitar. Scales, modes, chords, arpeggios, what, you name it, right? Anytime you have a shape that's true on, with the reference on the low E string, as soon as you move it up and now your reference is on the low A string, when you encounter the B string, something changes. All right, something changes. That's true of everything else. It's also true, as we'll see, of the D shape. But so again, the C shape and the A shape. Again, if I do my C shape, so notice that if I put my one over here, so normally for my G shape, I go here, then I go here, and in the G shape, the one would be right over here. But because this is the B string, we have to move it up. And there it is. Sorry, it's a one here and three over here. There's the C shape. So a C major shape is a G major shape that you move up and you have to compensate for that missing half step on the B string, all right? Now that relationship, remember, between going right and going left, let's see what time it is, cool. Between going right and going left on from a reference over here is going to be the same with the C shape and the A shape. So remember, and I'm gonna use this document over here, but when I use, there it is. So when my reference is on the E string, I can go left using a G shape, right using an E shape. And if my reference is on the A string, I'll have the C shape to the left and the A shape to the right. So that gives me now four ways to play a chord. Say I want to play, you know, let's say A flat major is all over the fretboard. So A flat over here, I can go left, I can go right, and then I can also find my A flat on the A string here, and I can go left with a C shape and right with a A shape. All right. Whew, hope everything makes sense for everyone. Trying to make this as clear as possible. So now the D shape is the same thing. Again, what happens if I take that A shape and I move it up again? Well, let's do this together. Boom, boom. All right, so I take an A shape and now I move my reference here on the D string. So again, I'm gonna go up my fifth. No problem yet, haven't encountered the the B string, but where normally I would have my one over here, uh-oh, it's the B string, have to go up a half step. And then my third, we go back to normal. Recognize a D major, that's normal. Again, same exact voicing, one, five, one, three, five. It's the same exact voicing between an E shape, an A shape, and a D shape, but the shapes are different because of the B string, all right? So that's it, we have all the shapes, C, A, G, E, D. But now the question would be, why don't we have another shape that goes left of the D shape, just like there was a shape that goes left of all the other shapes? Well, there is a shape that goes left of the D shape. But let's take a look over here. All right, let's say I'm here. So I get my D shape, it goes one, five, one, three. 
Well, on the other side, again, it would be just like taking a C shape and moving it up. So here, the third would be here, just like normal. Here, the fifth would normally be here, but it's the B string, so it goes up here. And then finally, back to normal, here's my one. Now that shape, which is the shape that goes left of a D shape, well, it's not really a shape. Some people call it the F shape because it looks like the first F chord that you learn over here open. But look at this. Recognize a shape here? That's the E shape. So the, this F shape is actually a piece of the E shape. So it's not really a new shape. So therefore, we don't, that's why we don't have a caged F. <laughs> well, first of all, it would ruin kind of the acronym, right? Caged is kind of easy to say. Caged F kind of sucks. I guess you could put F caged, depending on your level of anger towards that system. But again, we scratch this because that's actually the E shape. All right. It's a portion of the E shape. And so again, it would be like taking a map and then adding a piece of the map on that end that's actually the same thing as the piece of the map that's over here. It's like, thank you, but I already know this part. It's already on this side of the map, so you don't need to repeat it. That's why we don't repeat it, okay? Does that make sense, everyone here? This is, I guess, you know, again, it takes a while to really establish a system like the cage system if you really want to understand what's going on. Cool. So let's talk a little bit about intervals in the cage system. So I'm going to exit this over here. So now that we've laid out our foundation, that we've laid out the ones, the threes, and the fives of our cage system. See you later, Danny. Thanks for being here. So now that we've laid, laid out the ones, the threes, and the fives, Let's see what we can do and how we can access our other chord tones around these references. Actually, sorry, never mind. Before I go into this, I forgot something. I'm going to go back. Um, I forgot to show you how the cage system strings together. So, you know, we took all these shapes and we established that we can move them up and that you can go left, you can go right. Well, we haven't seen, but again, it will be in the documents is this kind of, it's not obvious that that would happen, but if you look at how these shapes fit together, again, there is a reason why we call it the caged system, is that they always go in the same order and they all connect. They're all interconnected in a way, in a certain sequence, where they kind of fit together over a whole octave of the fretboard, and then it repeats when you go up to the next octave. So E, D, C, A, G. So cage system, again, depending on what your reference is, the first shape that you're going to have here is going to be different. Of course, if your reference is F, F is on the first, on the low E string right here. So your first available caged shape is the E shape. But if we were in B flat major, for example, my first available shape mm. is the A shape. All right. Over here. So depending on your um depending on your ref on your reference it's going to start in different spots so you have to see the cage system more like a a circle again so we say caged because it's easy to start so you to start with the letter c right but really it's a circle right the c shape always goes into the a shape which always goes into the g shape which always goes into the e shape which always goes into the d shape etc right and then that goes back into the c shape but again notice how interconnected these shapes are which makes sense because they're made of the same chord tones they're all one threes and fives so this is what again the layout is this is what the fretboard looks like from the standpoint of ones threes and fives just wanted to make sure i go through this before we move on okay so intervals again, to go back to this, now that I know where one, three, and five are, it's very easy to find the other intervals. Because what you notice is that 
every interval is usually close to either a one, a three, or a five. So say I'm on my fretboard and I'm in this D shape, for example, let's just start this one. And I wanna know where a two is. Where do I find a two? Well, if we go back here, we notice that the major second, which that's what I call two for short, is a whole step above one. So anytime I find one in my shape, I know that one whole step above, I have two. All right, that's pretty easy. I also know that two is a whole step before the third, right? My third is here and I go down a whole step, boom. So I could get my two down a whole step over here to the open string. Now that's really practical because if I'm playing a D major, I need a, I think something happened here. Garage band decided to, said it was a good idea to just stop. All right, cool. Sorry about that. So here is a D major. Yes, Jason, we are going to get into inversions briefly in a little bit. So if I take this one note up a whole step, now I get a chord, but with a second instead of my one. So that's really convenient if I want to make this major chord into an add two. If I want to make it to a sus two, I would actually take the third and replace it with the second, and I just release this finger, and I got my sus two. Right? The difference between sus two and add two, sus two, you replace the third with the second, add two, you keep the triad intact, and you add the second. Okay, so you can see how you can navigate all these shapes and quickly find intervals. If I want to find a seventh, the seventh is a half step before the one. So in an E shape, for example, is over here. Anytime I find a one down a half step and I have a seven, that's really useful. When, for example, from a major chord, I want to make a major seven. I can, for example, take this one, go down a half step, and now I have a major seven. So now you understand the dynamics between or the logic underneath each shape. You might have played major sevens for years before you actually knew where the seventh was, why. For example, something that's counterintuitive on the guitar is that you, on the piano again, if I want to play a four note chord, I just add a note to a three note chord. But on the guitar, all my fingers are already taken most of the time. So I need to sacrifice another note that's repeated and then sometimes even take a finger off the fretboard to make that a bigger chord. For example, from this, if I take off my pinky, I now play a note that's a whole step before my one, which would be a minor seventh. So that's why if I take my finger off, I've got a seven chord now, a dominant seven chord, okay? Yeah, and I hope this makes sense, but that's what's amazing with the cage system is you get to understand all these things, right? You get to see what's actually happening under the hood over here. Awesome. So knowing this about the intervals, that also um, explains where the minor shapes come from. What's the difference between a major and a minor chord? We saw that. The difference is the third is flat in a minor chord. So you understand where the minor shapes come from because anytime you encounter a three, if you just bring it down by a half step, you get a minor chord. Now you see why this is the D minor shape. You see why when I play my E major and I lift this finger off, it becomes an E minor because it turns out my third in this fat shape over here is not the third note after the root, like it would make sense. It's one, two, three, four. It's on the G string over here. And therefore now I see why when I lower it, I have my minor chord. And again, that's gonna have a, so many repercussions on everything that you play on a guitar. And everything, oh, by the way, the, all these diagrams, the construction of the cage system, everything is on that PDF that I'm gonna send you. If you stick around, I'll send the link and you'll receive that for free. So 
um, make sure you stick around. Sweet. So we're going to go through a few other subjects. And then, of course, I'm going to talk to you about some practical applications. So one of the things that you can now do when you understand the cage system is go back to those original three note triads that pianists, for example, learn first, right? Those are the first things they learn is those three note triads because on the piano, it makes more sense. But on the guitar, we have to go through this whole roundabout and reverse engineer the whole thing, learn those big chords, voicings, until finally we start thinking, okay, well, do I have to play those big notes, those fat, sorry, those big chords with six notes? Because at the end of the day, all I need is a one, a three, and a five to play a major chord or a minor chord. One flat, three, five. And that's true of all other triads, by the way, diminished, augmented, focusing on major and minor right now. So when I look at a shape, there is many little clusters of three notes that I can find in this shape that give me a one, a three, and a five in different orders. And those are actual triads, right? The OG triads with just three notes, not those weird big voicings of triads. And those little trimmed down triads are absolutely amazing. They're super cool to play because they allow you, again, when you start playing in bands and stuff, when you're by yourself, it's good to have big voicings because you're the only player. It's good to occupy as much of the sound spectrum as you can. But when you're in a band, you are competing for that sound spectrum. There's a bassist, there's a pianist, there's another guitarist sometimes. So you need to have options to play what you need to play, for example, if it's a major chord, and occupy different spots of the sound spectrum. So by knowing those little triads that are embedded in each shape of the cage system, you get access to those things. For example, rather than playing A major here, I can play these three notes and I get the same result. And each shape of the cage system has its little trim down groups of three notes that you can play. All right. So that's super, super, super useful. Because again, there's there's many times we don't need to repeat notes. And depending on the styles that you're playing, these little triads can be amazing. For example, if you're playing funk, it's rare to go. Right, that sounds more like pop. A funk guitarist would probably do something more. Like Right? And those little groups of triads, because you're not using all your fingers, they also allow you to go and grab some color notes. So for example, if I play this little trim down here group of notes, so again, the three higher strings of my big shape over here, now I have two fingers that I can use to make some little... All right, now I have these little, I can do some little hammer-ons, so... Right? Having these extra fingers allows me to more freedom to add extensions, color notes, to mix some chords with some little fragments of melodies. So in terms of, in terms of progression, and again, I'll give you the step by step here, but at some point, once you start getting comfortable with the full shapes of the cage system and laying out your fretboard really, really, really quickly, it's very um, important that you start being able to see these shapes without necessarily playing them and then just grab the notes that you want from these shapes. I don't want to play this big E shape. I just want these three notes over here. And one question that you might be asking yourself, Jason was here asking about inversions. So inversions are interesting. When you see these little groups over here, you notice that when I play this, my fifth is on the bottom. Right? I don't have my low note is no longer my root. So technically, this is not, for example, an A major, it would be an inversion of A major An inversion refers to the fact that we use the same three notes, but with a different note on the bass. Now here's the two ways. So just some vocabulary before I do this. If I take for example, C E G, which is a C major, right? So I have my one, my three, my five, 
the first inversion, this is what we call the root position, root position, because of course the root is on the bottom. If I take my root and bump it up to that octave over here, I get E, G, C. And this is called the first inversion. And we would write it C over E. And finally, if I go again, take this E and bump it up, I would get G, C, E. And that's what we call the second inversion. And it would be a C over G, if that makes sense. Okay, so you can invert a triad over its third or its fifth. That is, by the way, very important. Inversions are not voicings of a chord. They're a new chord, technically, because you're changing the root. So an inversion can have different voicing, just like a root position has different voicings, okay? So be careful here. Don't confuse inversions, which are an actual new theoretical tool from the voicing of a chord, which is how you perform um, that inversion or how you perform that chord, right? A little nuance over here. Because again, it's still true. If I want to play a C over E, as long as E is on the bottom, I can play any combination of one, threes, and fives on top. If E is my low note, it will be a C over E, if that makes sense. Okay, so this is for inversions. Now, here's the two main ways to think of inversion. Sometimes you'll, you'll play a tune and you'll actually see that written in the tune, C over E. That means the composer actually wants you and specifically wants the bass player to play an E. You actually want to hear that inversion and inversions have a weird sound. If I take a C major, Right? Over C, it sounds like this, or over the root. But over E, it sounds like this. Do you hear the dissonance? It's not nearly as consonant and resolving as a standard C on the bass root position. Okay? So that's an actual inversion that you want to hear as, you know, if you picture you're a band, the composer here in this case, or the bass player decides to play an inversion, it's going to have a real impact on the all over result of the band. And the listener is definitely going to hear that tension. Most of the time, these inversions are used because bassists, even though they love to play the tonics and the roots, sometimes they also want to play some cool stuff and play some lines. And for example, if you're going from a C to an F, well, you could add an E in the middle as a passing note on the bass. So it's the bass line, actually, the bass is going. And on that moment where you're playing open E going to F, you could go. So that was C over C, C over E. Right, so these inversions come from bass movements. All right, now, it's different from as a guitarist, for example, being part of a band and deciding to play an inversion just because, again, you want to just play a different, the play that triad in a different spot, but the bassist is still playing the same note. So in this case, for example, say, again, the, the music says A major, all right? So the notes of an A major, by the way, are A, C sharp, and E. Well, as far as long as the bass player plays an A, I can play any inversion as I want on top of this. It's still going to sound like an A major. Because again, as long as the low note is A, and by low note, I mean the lowest note of everyone playing in the band. And usually it's the basses that wins that battle. You can play any inversion you want on the guitar. It's still going to sound like a normal voiced A major without an inversion. And that has to do with something very important that I talk a lot about in my books and in my courses and stuff. It's the fact that there is a difference between what you think about when you play and the result, the heard result of what you're playing. I can think inversion of an A major, but if the bass player plays an A, the listener from the outside hears no inversion 
So I was thinking of an inversion, but the finished result is no inversion. That's very important when you want to learn how to manipulate modes and things like that. Because again, I can think, for example, C major. But if the bass player plays an A in the background, they reset the reference note to an A because the lowest note tends to win the battle of what note is a reference. And so that's really huge in the concept of modes. I did a whole master class on modes in the last one. So if you haven't seen it, uh, there is a replay on um, the website and there is a replay on my YouTube channel. Go ahead and watch that, okay? And it'll be a good complement to this one over here. All right. Yes, you do have to keep your bass player in line, Rob. Absolutely. To everyone watching here, Jeffrey, thank you. You say uh, easy to follow and understand. I really, that's what I hope for. That's what I try to do is, is be as clear as possible. So I appreciate that feedback. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, keep your bass player in line. Absolutely. That's why, you know, you can, everything else being perfect, if the bass changes, if the bass messes up, everything else falls apart. It's like pulling the rug from underneath you, right? It's like you could be whoever you want. Somebody takes the rug and pulls, you're gonna fall, right? <laughs> Even if you have great balance. So anyways, that's for um, this aspect over here. Trim down, try it. And again, I'll show you practical application. Pentonic scale, a beloved tool of the guitarist. What is the pentatonic scale? First of all, there's a major and a minor pentonic scale, and they're different scales. I'll do another thing probably on the pentonic, but for now, they're different scales. Yes, they're relative, but they're different scales because they have a different reference, or different reference. So even though, for example, a C major and an A minor pentonic share the same notes per se, so your allowed spots on the fretboard, to put it differently, are the same in both cases, the value of each of these notes changes completely, you know? So the C, let's take this example. The C major pentonic, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. So that's my major scale. A major pentonic is a major scale minus the fourth and the seventh, okay? Now the A minor pentonic is A, B, C, D, E, F, Ah, G. And a minor pentonic is a minor scale minus the second and the sixth, which, da da, it's the same notes, right? So you notice that whether it's the major and the minor scale or the major pentatonic and the minor pentonic, we have the same exact notes. But let's say I'm playing, and I always love to do this, right? Think of a note and then the context, the reference. Say I'm playing a C. Well, if I'm in C major and I'm using my C major, C is my reference, then C is the one. C is the note that resolves the tension. It's my home base. It's the red note on the cage system. So if I play a C and I'm in C major, I'm playing the one. But if I'm in A minor, my reference is A. What is C compared to A? It's a minor third. So the role of the note C is totally different whether you're in C major or A minor, which is why, again, relativity between scales should never be a clutch because it matters what you think when you play. And if you think A minor over C major, A is going to have an important place in your mind. You're going to play A way too often. You're going to play licks that are A minor pentonic bass rather than C major pentonic. Right? And again, here I play the same exact notes. Side note, little nugget here. Okay, pay attention to that. Those things are really, really important. They, they helped me so much when I understood those things. So I hope it helps you as well. So in terms of intervals of chord tones, a major pentonic is one, two, three, five and six, meaning my one, my major second, my major third, my perfect fifth, and my major six. Well, what do you see here? One, three, five. 
our beloved major chord tones that the cage system tells us where to find anywhere, anytime on the fretboard with any reference provided that we practice the cage system. Okay? So, knowing this, and again, this is going to be in the documents I'm going to send to you. If I know where my E shape is and where 1, 5, 1, 3, 5, etc. are, I just need to add the missing notes. And I got my major pentonic. And notice the similarities. Again, map over territory. The territory is just a bunch of notes. But notes are inert without a context. And when I say pentonic, I'm assigning value to the 1, the 3, the 5, and then the 2 and the 6. All right? And by, by assigning this value to, the one, to these notes, I want to know where to find them. They're important to me as an improviser. Playing them and playing them right is important when you do this, right? So that's why these tools are important. That's why theory is important. Maybe if you're playing by yourself in your room all the time, nobody's listening to you, which they probably don't want to if you're always playing the wrong notes, then it doesn't matter to you. But the moment you want to play with other people, the moment you're sick of trying to mess around and muddle through not knowing exactly where things are and what things are, the moment that these things become um, important to you, then you need to learn these things seriously. You need to spend time navigating your fretboard just like a pilot spends time studying a map to know where they're going and things like that. Super, super important. End of a rant. You can see where now if I if I know all these shapes over here and the corresponding major pentonic, first of all, it gives me an indication because you can see similarities between the caged shape and the pentatonic. So it's a great way to know where you're at and to remember the shapes of the pentonic scale. But more importantly, it allows you to know where your chord tones are in the pentonic scale. Because the pentonic scale it's a very safe scale to play. You're never going to play something that sounds outrageously bad when you play a pentonic scale. But understand that 1, 3, and 5 are still more consonant and important than the other intervals. The 2, for example, here's an E major pentonic. With my reference as a drone note, so you can hear the intervals. See how when I play E, everybody's like, ah. All right, that's home. The two is this one. Hear that tension? You want to, you know, a good melodist would... All right? Of course, sometimes the two, if you're in jazz, sounds really cool, right? Right? But depending on this, you have to know that these intervals are a little more tense. And so be in control of the effect you're going to have when you play these notes, if that makes sense. So again, it all comes down from knowing where 1, 3, and 5 are, and then of course, knowing where the other intervals are, because you know that they're going to have a special effect on your improvisation, on anything. Now finally, the minor cage system is to be overlapped over minor cage shapes. So you'll see over here, I have all my minor cage shapes. And it's very important, here's a, a, again a nugget. It's tempting when you understand the cage system, because guitarists, are, they love shortcuts, so when they can see one, they try to take it, to just learn the major cage system and then deduce the minor shapes. But if you know anything about my philosophy of teaching sequences, anytime you have a step between things, it's usually dangerous. So the danger here is everyone has to do their major shape before they find the minor shape. Please don't do that. Make sure that you learn the minor cage system and the major cage system separately and that you can play a D minor shape like this without having to go from the major shape and then go down to the minor shape. The reason why we don't learn other, we usually focus on major and minor cage system is because again, most music, most chords are major minor. But at some point, if you want to go into more advanced styles of music, yeah, you're going to have to map out your fretboard with also diminished shapes or augmented shapes. But major and minor are like super important to the foundation. Okay? Side note again. End of side note. So, again, every 
shape of the cage system in minor will have an associated minor pentonic. So the minor pentonic in terms of intervals is one, straight to the minor third, four, five, and then the minor seven. What do we have here? A minor triad, which is why knowing your minor cage system is going to be super useful. Okay. And then you just have to add the fourth and the flat seventh, which again are intervals that have some tension to them. These notes are going to be the ones that you're going to want to hang out or at least know where they are to resolve your tension and your melodies and stuff like that. Okay. So we're getting close to Q and A. So, and applications. If anyone has any questions, please put it in the description here. And I'm going to go ahead and keep going. All right, shameless, shameless self promotion for a little bit here as we get to the end of this thing. For those of you that don't know, um, there's many things that you can do to get to, you know, take steps to even get better at those things and to make progress and to have me help you. The first one, which is the most, uh, the least expensive way of doing this, is to buy my books. They're available on Amazon Music Theory for the Self Taught Musician Volume 1 and Volume 2. One is the basics, two is more complex harmony, chord progressions, improvisation. Usually, you should probably buy one before just to make sure you know all these notions. Everything that I, how, how music theory is organized in my mind, if you like the way I communicate right now, if you enjoy my dissecting of these notions, that's how I see music. And I've put all these things into these books. So, of course, they were written, you know, three years ago. I've, I've evolved since. There are certain things that have changed, perhaps, but the core is still intact and perfectly accurate in these books. So again, Amazon Music Theory for the Self-Taught Musician, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Um, they are available. Online courses. I'm working on some online courses um, that will condense everything that I teach my one-on-one -on -one clients plus many, 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 many exercises. So I've condensed the best of those material to make sure that you can access this step by step, explain theory and explain how those tools apply to fretboard navigation, etc. Okay. Um, they're not done yet. It's taking more time than expe expected. But if again, when you enter your email here, it'll take you to a page and I will allow you to pre order these courses. If you want to support me and if you trust me, you can pre order these courses at a pretty great discount. You'll see there's three courses. There's one that's just general guitar theory and fretboard navigation mastery. There's one that's that plus some free lessons with me or some included lessons with me and access to my personal phone. You can text me and I'll, I'll always be available to, um, to you for three months to act, answer all your questions. Okay. And finally, there is a funky guitar course. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm a big believer in funk guitar, specifically if you're interested in tightening up your rhythm guitar and your rhythm skills in general. Right? If you're like the Corey Wong style, funky style, that one's going to have a nice discount to it as well. I'm working on all these courses. They should be finished by New Year's. So it'll be a happy New Year present if you subscribe to these and you get them. And finally, if you want to just study with me directly, I know there's some of you here that already do, um, but I offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And again, after the link, when you enter your email, you'll get the documents and then they'll send you to a link where you can book a session with me. It's like a free session, kind of like a free lesson. Uh, no strings attached. It's just a way for us to know one another and um, a way for um, to see if you're ready to like jump into a program like that where for three to four months, I will literally, I'll take you by the hand and teach you everything, everything. All those diagrams, they come from my course. Think about it, that one module we had today, all these diagrams, they correspond to one module and there is like five module and each module has five courses. So you get out of this with a lot of material and you know theory from A to Z. All right. Thanks, Rob, saying that I'm an excellent writer. I really appreciate that. All right. End of the self-promotion. 
let's go into how to practice skate. There's a PDF with this um, on how I personally like to practice the cage system. But think about it like this. Again, the first thing is to focus on the major cage system and learn to play these movable shapes. So open E, bar E. Open C, bar C. Open G, bar G. All right, and move it up and down the fretboard. All right, D, bar D, A, bar A. The next thing is to learn to map out your fretboard with different notes of the cage system. So here what I love to use, and people that study with me probably know that I'm obsessed with this tool, but it's the random note picker. Again, everything will be in the exercise sheet. And I generate some notes, and let's say who B okay B it is I have to map out the whole fretboard in B majors now so I'll take the first B that I have available it's here on the A string then A shape goes into the G shape right of the D shape I have my E shape up an octave here I have my D shape then string together here you look at this little triad right after this I have my C shape, notice how they share this little bit here, these two shapes, and finally back here. So, then I'll do it with A sharp, then I'll do it with D, so all the flat the notes that are generated. Again, you're starting to map that, allows you to get to a point where when you hear, Hey guys, we're in B major you see those two notes and then your your fretboard kind of lights up with one threes and fives or when you're playing a chord progression which we'll see in just a second you're not just locked into one shape stuck moving a one bar chord all over the place you can access different voicings you can go left you can go right if you're you know over here in an a major going to b major you don't even have to move. You could just stay in this spot. And again, the voicing of each of these is different. And that again is going to expand to all the other tools, pentatonics, right? Every, again, every shape has an associated pentatonic. So here, if I'm in B major, or I can go the other way. So that's, again, map the fretboard out with all these tools over here, if that makes sense. Um, you should be able to go, Rob, directly to any one of these shapes, though, I assume, instead of finding another shape. Absolutely. And that comes to the next point, the next exercise, Rob. You're totally right. So the next exercise is to do precisely this. It's to kind of desequence um, this thing. And so here's how you do this. So on this exercise, what you do is you use the first note as a place where you have to put your index on the fretboard. So B, for example, is the first note here, and B is on fret seven on the E string. So I put my hand here, and then I'm stuck to this shape. All I can do is go down a fret or up a fret, but that's it. And so after this, you read all the other chords and you have to find them in this area of the fretboard because an amazing consequence of the cage system is because it covers the octave with five shape, five shapes, sorry, anywhere you are on the fretboard, there is a shape to play any chord. And that's amazing. So for example, okay, I'm locked here and I need to play A sharp right there, E shape. I need to play D flat right there. That's the G shape. I need a, sorry, there we go. So I was at D flat. I need to play, um, so the next one is, I'm right here, G sharp, right there in the D shape. I need to play an F, I'm locked over here, right here. Right, so you can, again, I'm playing very stupidly, 
But at some point, put a metronome on and imagine that you're reading a real chord progression in a gig or something, and you could just literally stay here and read the whole chord progression without moving your hand. You can go G flat, E, C sharp, then D sharp, and E flat, which is the same note, okay? So that's to do specifically what you're talking about here is to learn to just access a shape without having to go through the others, but just by thinking, where is my reference and do I need to go left or right? If I go left, so if my reference is on the E string, left is G, right is E. On the A string, left is C, right is A. And on the D string, left, right is D, and left would be still the E shape, of course, okay? So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Cruel yet effective, absolutely super effective. I mean, that is like, that's, um, it's cr and then again, it's the same with scales. If you're playing pentonic scales and it modulates, you have to go to another key, boom. It's, you can find it right there. You don't have to go to your E shape all the time. Uh, that's kind of the objective over here, all right? So where are we at over here? We have about, and again, by the way, while I've got everyone here, I'm going to send to you the link. I think it's time you guys have all stayed, or some of you here have stayed, and here is the link to get your document. Boom. All right, so. Click that link, it should work as a link, right, I hope. And then, yeah, there we go. And then get on there, put in your name, your email. I won't spam you, I'm only here to help. I will only tell you when things are coming out that I think you will be interested in, like other master classes, things like that. I'm not in this that sends spam. Um, I've always been very annoyed by spam, so, so does everyone probably. This is not my intention. Um, all right. So to the next part, real life application. So a real life application, here's how I love to practice those things. There's so many real life applications, but I'm going to go on YouTube. I'm gonna guide you through it exactly how I would do it when I'm wanting to just get a little practice in. All right, I'm gonna go back and track. And I'm gonna take a bank, I love that uh, elevated dram track. Uh, they have really cool stuff. Let's see what I can find. Here's a jam in B flat. So I'll look at the chord progression. And what I wanna do is again, start mapping my fretboard. So we're in B flat, I would just go through all my B flat majors just to kind of warm up, all right? By the way, a great way to visualize the cage system is before you play it on the guitar, Put the guitar down. I know sometimes you don't like to do this. Take a blank fretboard diagram and practice mapping it like this. Because again, that allows you to really see what's going on before you go onto the territory. Like a pilot. Pilots study maps before they take off. Because once you're in the heat of it, it's a little bit too late to take your time and, and you know study your map. So you have to study a little bit before. And for this, sometimes letting go of the guitar and doing things on paper is awesome. Okay, so I have a chord progression, seems like that's gonna go from a G minor, all right, to an F major, to an E flat major here, okay? So the first thing I could do is try to find five different ways or a few different ways to play that chord progression using different shapes of the cage system. So for example, I could do so here's G minor on the first one, in the E shape. Then F would be in the D shape there. For, all right. Then E flat I can get over here in the C shape. And B flat over here in the G shape. Uh, let's see how this backing track sounds. I need to share the sound I think too if I want you guys to hear that. Share. Um, oops. It's not what I wanted. All right, there we go. Boom, so let's share this. 
that one here so you can see me mess up this great so anyways the the whole thing here is I am reading this chord progression trying to figure it out and trying to map it out in different shapes so maybe after that I'll go to my G minor shape here and go then the A shape So I'm just moving around, trying to, again, not always stay, stick to the same shapes and the same chords, etc., but rather trying to use my cage system, okay? That's an exercise here. Then after that, I can do it with my little strip down or trim down triads, okay? Now I imagine that I'm actually taking the role maybe of like a second guitar or playing some little arpeggios, and now I think, okay, well, G minor, I could do a little G minor here, and then a trim down try it here, that's the A shape that I'm borrowing from, F. Then E flat major right here. And then B flat I could get, or I could get here, or I could, you know, wherever you want, or over here if you want to. So if you want to stay closer to here, that one's probably better. Let's see what that would sound like. Again, a little, you know, funk here. And if I'm playing a little line, for example, little arpeggios, you can go. Right, so with these little triads, you can really take different spots and play different styles, some backbeat stuff. It's super, super useful. And then finally, of course, make sure everyone's still cool. All right. Sweet, sweet. Hey, Andy, good to see you. <laughs> um, so the last thing would be probably improvising over using a pentonic and little arpeggios. Little triads free up fingers too. They absolutely do. Yes, that's how I was saying. You can add all sorts of little Right. Right. And then so I would map my fretboard when B flat major. Again, it's relative to G minor. But I'm gonna, you know, assume that the person here is right, although I will say that looking for any person here that's taking the course with me, does look does this look like it's in B flat major or does this look like it's in G minor? Well, to me, it looks like it's in G minor because G minor lands on the strong beat of the harmonic rhythm, B flat on a weak beat. So, mm -mm. all right. The B section is a little more major, B flat majory. But again, those scales are, they're relative. So probably here, the person that made that backing track was like, well, you know, whatever. It's B flat. People can figure it out. But if you want to be technical, the first part is more a minor vibe and you can hear it. And then the second part, the major chord takes the spotlight. So that's a situation where you can like really try to emphasize or work on that ambivalence between major and minor relative, where again, 
you're going to play the same notes, but each note is going to have different meaning. And therefore, you have to remap your fretboard when you're switching from the major to the relative minor and vice versa. So again, pentonic, I would have my G minor here in the, e in the D shape here. And I have my C shape here. Then I have my A shape. And then my G shape. So that's gonna be my basis for improvisation. I'm gonna have fun with that as much as I can, right? Just try to, again, if you play these notes, they won't sound bad. But if you wanna sound really good, target the one, the three, and the five, right? can do it as kind of like practicey or freely as you want you know you could start with just kind of trying to play the scales up and down in each shape to really get familiar with your cage system and then you can loosen up and start just improvising making solos having fun right but when you do a practice like that where you go through this whole process of Picking a backing track, looking at the chords, or a tune, it doesn't have to be a backing track, by the way, a tune that you're learning, trying to map out the cage system, play it in different shapes, and then use those trimmed down triads, and then start improvising and mapping out with your main tool for improvisation, well, you're going to be in the best possible spot to just play as as well as you as you possibly can you'll know where your notes are how to play over it and then the only difference between that and a badass solo is experience stylistic remember in those seven fields stylistic knowledge just transcribing some tunes and you know some of those little things that only come with time and practice right um, the tone your articulation how you can you approach your melodic ideas but at least you're not gonna play the wrong notes. And that's huge, right? It's a huge step forward when you get to the point where you don't play the wrong notes. It's already huge. And where you can see a track like this and go right into a solo, move up and down the fretboard in each shape of the cage system, and you're good. So finally, before we get into Q&A, I want to, we talk a lot just about some limitations, right? You'll see some people on the online be like, the cage system is, you get stuck in the shapes and stuff and so there is some truth to that sometimes the cage system is a little limiting because you spend so much time studying each box that it's hard sometimes to string these shapes together and to really f have a more vertical or diagonal approach to navigating the fretboard but again that doesn't discount the qualities of the cage system that just means that sometimes a map is not on, one map is not enough to really navigate your fretboard. You need other maps. 
You need other techniques and practices and there's other frameworks that allow you to kind of like fix that, to really complete what you lack in the cage system and sometimes some of the limitations that it might bring with it, okay? So I hope that that makes sense. Um, all right, whew, so that was a real life application. I am going to open it up for you guys here. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the uh, comment over here and I will answer them. All right, I, I'm trying to see if there is one that um, haven't answered yet, but I think I pretty much went through the ones that kind of popped up over here. But if you have another one, just, yeah, please um, feel free to ask some questions. Otherwise, um, Otherwise, here are again the things that you can do. Um, you can sign up for, oops, sorry, here, that's not the one. There we go. You can sign up for the free documents. To get the free documents, just simply go to the link that I put here in the description. Um, I might put it again. Let's see. Um, there we go. Copy. Here's another one. Okay, Rob, great, so glad I could make it. At first I thought this would be like when I apply a final coat of paint to fill in little bits that I missed. I did that, but it turned out those bits were significantly bigger than and more numerous than I thought. Oh, that I'm I'm glad that you got some value there. I really I'm really glad. I really hope that you guys enjoyed and that this is going to kind of give you a little more clarity when you start practicing about you know what you can practice and why the cage system, cage system is so useful. Um, so again, sign up here if you want the documents. Um, other than that, if you want to get those pre-sale courses, again, right after you get those documents, it'll send you to a, a link where you have some buttons and it'll take you there. Books, always available on Amazon. Please get them if you want. They're uh, you know, the result of all those things and I, I bet they will help you. And then finally, if you want to go a step further, well, we can talk. All right. Let's, we can book a, you know where to reach me, but there is, of course, there's a, a link to book a call with me where we'll hang out for an hour and we can talk about your goals, where you're, you're at specifically and how I can take you hopefully to the next level of your guitar journey. All right, I'm gonna wait those. Um, James said about to order the second book. Thank you so much. That really means a lot. And if you like the first one, and you read it and you ordered it on Amazon, give me a review there. Um, these are really useful. Um, they help a lot. So feel free to just go on there and put well, whatever you think it really is. I like four and five star reviews. Five stars because they build up Four stars because they're still good reviews, but they make the book look a little more real. No, nothing has five star reviews. Nobody can do something that um, you know applies to everybody. Mark says, first book is my Bible about to start the second. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate that. Um, you guys are awesome. Um, yeah, so again, I mean, there's five more minutes till the normal end of this course, of this um, masterclass. And if you have any questions, then go for it. Can't thank you enough, Will. Thank you so much, Rob. I hope that the absence of questions is due to the fact that I just explained everything perfectly. <laughs> so you don't have any questions. Um, but yeah, don't hesitate if you have any. And if they come up later, you can, of course, contact me. And I will be, again, you know where to reach me. And um, I'll gladly answer these questions. But cool, thank you so much. So no questions. Again, I'll wait till the the actual time over here. We have a little bit. Um, so the documents again are in there. I did have, I don't think there is the one on the trim down triads, but you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in there. Let's see. Trim down triads. So yeah, you have really everything you need. Okay, cool. 
sweet. And then, um, oh, here's a good question. Um, so you don't like to think as A minor and C as the same shapes? No, because they're not the same shapes. Let's take an example. So again, let's say we're in C major. In C major, let's put ourselves in, for example, a shape. Say we're in the G shape. So the G shape would mean for C major would be five, six, seven, eight over here. So I would have my one over here, which is C, then my three, then my five, and my one, then my three, and then my one over here. So that's it's the of course since we're in C major, if we're in we're looking at this area, that's the G shape. What I'm gonna say is true of all areas, but let's just put ourselves in this situation so we can see what's happening. In C major, those are the notes that I'm going to want to target. Now, in terms of my options for improvisation, the notes that will quote unquote work. Oh, actually, sir, sorry, I noticed that I haven't shared my screen. There we go. Sorry, guys. So again, we're in C major. I'm putting myself right here in See how I play the shape first? A nice C major to kind of anchor my ear in this major E sound. And then I play the note. I know where my ones are here, here, my third, my fifth, okay? And my options for improv are all these notes, right? All the missing notes. So we have the six here, the two, all the notes of the major pentonic scale. What happens when I get into an A minor context? These numbers change completely. And even though I'm playing the same notes, quote unquote, which I shouldn't really, because some notes are now gonna be, be more important, more valuable than others when I switch my reference. So one, sorry, here, three, five. So when I'm in uh, my new context, try to line these up, but it's, it's pretty poorly executed. So I'm gonna go right here. So my shape is gonna be the same in terms of the notes that I'm playing. Those are my dots, okay? Boom. But is this note the one? Not at all. The one is here. And it's A. And now I'm in an A minor context. So the best way to think about this, this combination of notes is with a new map. It's like taking my flight map to take my road map, right? We're changing our map from major to minor. And now my chord tones are one, five, one, flat three, five, one. And all the other intervals of the minor pentatonic scale. So what used to be my one is my flat three. What used to be my two is my four. Now, these intervals are all changed. So again, it's like seeing the same things with different values. So please do yourselves a favor. Again, you can believe whoever you want there. Do yourselves a favor and practice your major stuff separate from your minor stuff for a while. And then you start kind of studying the connections between the two. If we're in A minor and we're jamming together and you say we're in A minor, first of all, it's different from being in C major. And I don't know if I've been to jam sessions sometimes, some people go like, we're in A. I'm like, a what? They're like, well, an A. I'm like, yeah, but that's, that doesn't mean anything. Okay, A is important, I understand. A is our one, what else? <laughs> you know, minor, oh, A minor. Okay, we're in A minor. What is my context? I have my E shape, my G shape, my D minor shape, this one, and this. Those are my chord tones, and over each of these shapes, I can play the minor pentatonic. And my ones again 
are in different spots that when I go to C all right so very very important Jake thanks for doing this free session definitely would dwell into these documents and check out those jam tracks and probably interested in purchasing some of the specific courses in the future thank you so much um, so does that make sense with why I don't like to mix these two a minor and C are not the same shapes they're the same notes but they're not the same shapes and until you really learn to switch that vision from major to minor over the same group of notes you'll you'll notice your lines being like not it seems like something's not quite right and you know there's many reasons why guitarists sometimes get into spots where they're like I don't know yeah my solos they're not the best like I know my scales but you probably do know your scales and there's many ways that your solos might not be exactly how you want them to one of those ways is as simple as not having the right framework when it comes to major versus minor to think of an a minor pentonic when you're actually in c major because again what's the safest note to play if someone says we're in a minor it's a <laughs> Is A a safe note in C major? Not really. In A, in C, sorry, A is the sixth, which is a fairly dissonant interval. It's not bad sounding, but it's dissonant. So you need to know, you need to know those things. It's gonna have a real life impact on your improvisation. And you will hear it, and then you'll be like, why is it not exactly what I think it's gonna be? It's sometimes for those reasons sometimes for something else and again the the best thing is to have someone help you when those when those things happen like that's why there is people like me that like to teach and help and educate and things like that um, it's for those reasons all right so I hope that makes sense John you said makes sense maybe that's why I'm tripping up I hope so that would mean that I, I helped you fix a problem. And if I can do that, then I my job is job here is done, right? If I can add a little value to your guitar journey, I'm happy. All right, everyone. I'm gonna get going. Um, I wish you a great weekend, a great west rest of your weekend. Hit me up if you have any questions. Share. Follow me on channels if um, you like what I do. And I'm sure I'll see you in a further lesson. So again, thank you very much for supporting, for staying here, and for sticking around. I really, really appreciate it. And I will see you in the next masterclass or maybe on a call or somewhere else. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. All right, how do I, there we go.